to the Best Practices Show. So excited to have you here today. And this just marks a very exciting week for us as we kind of re-gear and re-fire up uh, and bring you a whole bunch of new cool stuff with some great, great educators. And today is no exception. So uh, my good friend, Dr. Mark Hyman, and you and I have been together for about 150 weeks now, just showing up and trying to help dentistry as best we can. And uh, here we go, you know, so uh, tell us. What a joy to see you. Yeah, well, you've been at it for a long, uh, uh, well, first of all, today, you've, you've been at it since 7 a.m., right? I have, I started teaching my UNC Adams School of Dentistry students for our 7 a.m. breakfast club. We meet every Monday morning and um, it's just been fantastic. We have to do it over Zoom, but it's yeah. still really cool. And they're so smart and so talented and they did remind me that it's a holiday weekend coming up and they're gonna be rid of me for a few weeks, but that's all cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. So, and today we're gonna to be talking about the secrets to having more dentistry happen in your practice on a regular basis. Um, you and I talk a lot. We have great passion for dentistry and all of this. And so much education is on the um, technical side of things, but a lot of people don't talk about the soft skills. And while we're in a difficult time in dentistry, like you and I have never seen this before. We've never had pandemic training. It's been a challenge. Um, dentistry will come back. It already is coming back. It's surging back in a lot of different respects. Um, tell us, I always like to know people that haven't seen this. Now there's over 38,000 people that follow the best practice. So some of them haven't been on the COVID conference. There's people that are in the best practices, uh, private Facebook group. If people don't know who you are, I want to give them a little background on who you are, you know, your story, you, how you and I met, where we've been in the last couple of weeks. And let's talk about how dentistry is going to come back specifically with what we're going to talk about today. Sure. Kirk, again, what a joy to be here with you. Again, it does seem like it. We start off often saying, welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends, and we're still here. So again, I'm Mark Hyman. I was born in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, went to undergraduate dental school, did a two-year hospital residency, and now teach at the UNC Adams School of Dentistry. So I'm a quadruple Tar Heel. And I'm famous at the UNC School of Dentistry because I was probably the worst first semester of dental student in the history of UNC. I was our class president, just cruising, coaching in mural football, and basketball, and soccer, and playing all these sports, and midterms came, and I got crushed. And the first week back of spring semester, first year of dental school, I quit dental school because I was a loser, and I knew I could never do it. And I went to tell the dean I was going to quit, walked out of his office, and ran into a young professor, Dr. Ron Strauss, who saved my life because he said, Mark, being a dental student is nothing like being a dentist. Give it another hour. Give it a day. See how you do. And I had a decent morning, went back, told the dean I wasn't going to quit. He acted disappointed. May he rest in pieces. And by the time I got through first year of dental school, started in clinic that summer and caught fire. And I graduated dental school in three and a half years. I went over to Israel, was, worked as a volunteer dentist, grew a beard, grew my hair long, tried to look like the brothers. And my last week there, I met my wife. And as of February, we've been married 35 years. So it was an extraordinary trip for me. And then I bought basically a bankrupt, stalled practice in Greensboro, North Carolina. Started July 1st, 1986, a receptionist quit. I fired the hygienist, had one employee left, total implosion. And then I heard Ms. Linda Miles speak, the grand dame of management leadership. And Linda was wonderful to me. Between Linda, Dr. Gordon Christensen, Dr. Kathy Jamison, Dr. Owen Becker from Panky, I had these giants of dentistry take a great interest in my career. And our practice just exploded. And I was very, very fortunate. So we went from two and a half employees when I started to 17 when I left private practice at the end of 2017 to teach and lecture. So um, there's always a question, have you earned the right to speak? And I feel like I have because I made every mistake in the book. And frankly, Kirk, I think I know the secret to success in private practice. And if the listeners, viewers are interested, we'll talk about it this evening. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of yours and um, there's no question that you've had great success at having, you know, just sharing so much information, even getting the inside secrets from one of your top employees or team members last week. That was awesome. First of all, do you have any photos of when you like grew all that out? Um, <laughs> I, I, it's not pretty. 
You see a picture of me, but you know why animals eat their young. Yeah, you got to share that. You got to share that. It, it now, is okay. Yeah. Now, take me through the evolution. I always love to talk about the why this is so important because you talk to a lot of dental school students. You're involved heavily with the UNC School of Dentistry. You have your breakfast club. You've had a chance to speak all over the country. People are working so hard, especially now coming back. And they work so hard in the technical dentistry, but the other aspects of it are so, tell us about the why this is so important, you know? Right, Kurt, I think that the obvious thing is you have to be competent clinically. You have to be able to do a basic level of quality care. That, right. That's a given, but to the relationship with the patients is what, it's the only way that you thrive and succeed in private practice. Yeah. Because you can look at your patient and say, look at my margins. Look how I use this shim stock to adjust your CRCO skid. That doesn't really build a practice. No. It is about the relationships with your team, with the patients, and, and with yourself. I think yeah. to set attainable, achievable goals and uh, to fulfilling goals for yourself in practice, it's really important. And uh, I loved private practice. I look at our young doctors. I worry about many of the young men and women that say, is there still a future of private practice? Am I going to have to work for a DSO? And there's nothing wrong with a DSO. But there's still the brilliance to me and the joy of owning your own business, sculpting it exactly in the image of what you want, hiring the dream team that you want to work with and guiding these magnificent men and women and getting out of their way. And if you do that, you can be so successful. It is unbelievable. There's still an unlimited opportunity to me for private practice dentistry where you're in relationships with your patients right. and you deliver something distinctive and then people will pay with appreciation. It's yeah. just, it's a, it's a turbulent time, Kirk, and it's the greatest time in my mind there's ever been to be a dentist. Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate. But Mark, I have so many dentists around me, though. You don't understand. It's very competitive, you know. Um, and it's, you know, it's true. When you're a young dentist, you think like that. I have a lot of debt. Um, you make it sound so easy to find the right team, all that kind of stuff. These are things, these are not easy things. You know, I think that's important. I think and you and I've talked about this a lot. A lot of people want the accoutrements or, you know, the results of success, but a lot of people don't understand that you have to do the small things that allow for great success later on. It's so true. Now, Kirk, you mentioned about location. There's a lot of dentists around me. I moved my practice to Drill Hill in Greensboro, North Carolina, Oak Crest Avenue, one block. There's like 20 dental offices on it. If you look mm -hmm. at a map of Greensboro, the two wealthiest subdivisions are bisected by Oak Crest Avenue. So all the dentists flock there like lemmings. And to me, when I moved there, there were some of my colleagues that were unhappy. And the answer was, it's not my problem. They don't pay my bills. I'm not really competing against them. I'm competing against 70-inch plasma TVs, uh, HD TVs, trips to Disney, trips over to Europe, new cars. That, that's what we're really competing against. You know, half the population doesn't even go to the dentist every year. If we could raise the utilization 1%, it would be colossal. The other fact is that half of the patients that go to the dentist every year don't get a complete exam and aren't in a relationship with their patients. Yeah. If we could just slow down and use some of the cool innovations in dentistry, man, you're going to be so busy you can't see straight. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a great time to be a dentist. You got debt? I understand that. Yeah. I understand that about the debt. I guarantee I can show every dental office listening tonight. I guarantee if they trust me and do one thing, they will add a thousand dollars a day minimum. Yeah. If most dentists work 200 days a year. That's a $200,000 increase over five years. That's a million dollar change in your practice. You cannot tell me that it can't be done like that where you live. Cause I spent my career in Greensboro, North Carolina, where our three biggest employers were furniture, textiles, and tobacco. Right. How do those industries do? They all got slaughtered. Yeah. People didn't bring in wads of cash saying, hey, look, I don't have any insurance. Can I just put down a couple hundred and reserve this appointment? Uh, very uh, occasionally we got some cash. Yeah. Um, well, usually they were the shady people named Baron, but that's okay. Yeah. No, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. It was just crazy. That, um, people come in and say, I can't pay for this. And you, I, one of the great gifts I can offer dentistry is to ask one more question. Right. I can't pay a crown. I'm not, I can't pay for it. Right. And ask why. Well, because I'm going to Disney with the family tomorrow. We're flying business class, getting picked up by a limo and staying at the Grand Floridian. It's not that you can't pay for things. It's that you chose to pay for that vacation. Yeah. The other thing I love to do, Kirk, is break things up into small pieces. My blessed father 
He's been gone six years. He passed at 90 years old. My pop used to say, son, you can lift an elephant if you cut it into small pieces. So, Kirk, how much is a crown in typical practice in, for an act consulting organization? It can be all over the place. You know, it's hard to say. There are practices we go to see and somebody's charging 750 for a crown and then you've got... Let's call it for argument's sake. Let's, let's, say, let's say 950 to 1100, somewhere in there. Basic let's, starting range. Exactly. Let's call it 1200 for simplicity. Right. For sure. That's $100 a month. Yeah. That's $25 a week. Right. It's a couple of Starbucks a day. So you break it down into those small pieces. Is twelve hundred a lot of money? You're dang right, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Is a cup of coffee a lot of money? Well, everybody throws that away per day. It's pretty hard to find someone that doesn't throw away three bucks a day, four bucks a day. So that's the thing is that you can look the patient in the eye and say, "You guide me. How healthy you want to get? How soon you want to get there? What's right. a comfortable number for your family budget?" Is it a cup of Starbucks? Is it two cups of Starbucks? Is it three? You break it down in something that's palatable yeah. and that they go, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Now, a common challenge, I have two questions for you. The first one is this, is that you and I were talking about this last week. There are a lot of young dentists that are well mean. They go into practice and they start talking to patients and telling the patients, you need this, you need that. And with little success, they get a few crowns, but then there's a certain turning point. When was the turning point for you where you're like, wow, I got to start really communicating. I think you were the one that told me this. It's probably many years ago. The degree, how well you communicate is going to determine how far you go in dentistry or something like that. And I was like, that is, it's pretty, it's pretty intuitive or pretty sharp. You're way ahead of me in this, but like, what, what was the turning point for you when you're like, I got to start really communicating with patients? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Kirk. The great gift for me was I started private practice in 1986, January 90. I started going to the Panky Institute. Right. Where Dr. Erwin Becker pounded me verbally and got me to stop practicing aerobic dentistry, running from room to room, back and forth and back and forth, doing one tooth, and to slow down to get in a relationship with my patients. Right. I'd listen to what their goals are for their health and teeth and smile. I did another webinar where they quoted me saying, when I stopped telling people what they needed and started listening to what they wanted, everything changed. And that's the truest thing ever. Right. Nobody needs anything, Brother Bill. Blatchford brought that to dentistry. Mm -hmm. Better four-letter word, Kirk, is not that one. Yeah. What, what do you want? <laughs> what, do you want? <laughs> what do you want? Yeah. I'm trying to be their daddy. And when yeah. I talk to my students at UNC, I show them we, we have a, a slide where there's eight choices of treatment. Mm -hmm. And one eight range is to do nothing, to watch it, to get a pre-denial, to fill it to refill it, to crown it, to crown root canal it, to pull it and do an implant, to pull it, do a partial. You know, saying that you've got a choice here, but to talk to the patient and say, it's your body, it's your health. I'm not going to tell anybody, Kirk, you need to floss. I would think right. it's a better way to say, Kirk, why would you floss? What right. benefit are you seeking? Is it fresh breath? Mm -hmm. Is it saving money? Is it your mama got scaling root planning and it hurt her? And she said, son, don't ever get that done. I don't know what it is unless I ask. Right. I don't know what your buying signals, what your hot buttons are, unless I have the audacity to ask the right question and listen. So we right. use the expression, let's out listen the competition. It sounds almost trite, but man, it's so true. And that it just sort of, it sort of became a game to me. And that's not a good way to put it, mm -hmm. but pretty much every patient that I saw for the most part, I've been to another dentist either recently or had been several years. So the game became for me to try to figure out why did they say no to them and how do I get them to say yes to me? And it became kind of fun. Our level of case acceptance in our team, our team was, Kirk, extraordinary. Right. I had an unbelievable group of women that loved me and were loyal to me and worked so hard. And we weren't perfect. I was a great boss most of the time. And sometimes I'd face plant and Probably just like you, oh, I didn't know what I was getting right. I always tried, yeah. and I tried hard, but I tried to be an extraordinary boss and to guide them and coach them and pay for exquisite equipment and training and then get out of their way. So th that would be one of my gifts to the young dentists watching today is hire bright men and women. I'll hire attitude over experience any day of the week, yeah. spend a lot of time and money on training and then get out of their way and yeah. trust them. Yeah, so, so when I, 
I showed pictures of my dream team. What I love to point out is every woman in that picture worked for someone else before me. Right. People say, well, Dr. Mark, you got the greatest team. Other people had them. Mm-hmm. They had these diamonds in the rough and didn't shine them up. Right. Yeah, and that's the big, that's the single greatest asset that you can ever have. I want to go back to a couple of things you said. The whole want um, versus need thing is very powerful, and that's been the argument for a long time. People don't like paying for things they need. I hate it. You hate it. Actually, Bill Blatchford said that years ago. Um, people don't even need tea. They can eat chicken on the bone. They've demonstrated they don't even need it. Do you know what I mean? So, um, First time I heard Bill say that, that pissed me off, man. <laughs> and the third time I heard him say it, I was like, son of a gun, you're right. I know, I had heard it a couple of times. And then I started noticing when I would go other places, either to get my oil changed or wherever, people would say, well, you need to have this. And a gutter guy came to my house and said, you gotta do, you need to have that one. I'm like, who do you think you are? And so I think the important thing is really listening. Now, I will say this about you too. This isn't just talk, like even last Friday when we were called, I, you and I talked on the way home and it carried into my, my garage and you're an extraordinary listener. Like you're a very, you're an excellent listener. And I think um, that shows up, it, it probably showed up throughout your entire career. Um, just people, people really understand how much you care when you're authentically listening to them, when they're, when they're sharing, pouring out their heart to you. And that's, that's a big part of being a dentist. Now, one other thing I want to mention about this is the team aspect of things, because the single greatest asset, you and I are both in the same, it's not a CAD cam, it's not a facility, it's not a web page, it's the people around you. Um, and tell us a little bit about that. Like it, it hasn't been roses for you the whole time. Like it wasn't an easy road. You had to take some hard hits like I have where you're like, okay, I've screwed this up enough where you start to, to make a mistake one time is okay, but to repeat it is stupid. And there's a certain pattern, success leaves clues and having the right people around you starts with you, right? It is so true. The, the receptionist, when I bought my practice, quit six weeks after I started. I fired the chain smoking hygienist. Mm-hmm. I had one employee left who stayed with me eight and a half years. Yeah. I hired a hygienist for two weeks. She stayed 14 and a half years. And I hired a receptionist who was 21 years old. She stayed five years before she had a baby, moved back to California. My longest term teammate, Mary Catherine Ward, my receptionist only stayed with me 25 years. Her who you met Tina Calloway, my superstar dental assistant, was with me 19 years, three of the hygienists, 15. I, I tried to be the best boss I could. Yeah. I didn't get it right every time for them. Sometimes I infuriated them. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't because I didn't try hard. Sometimes I was distracted. Sometimes I just flat didn't get it right. The worst hire of my career, a woman walked in, looked me in the eye and said, I think Coach Dean Smith is God. Those you don't know, that was the longtime North Carolina basketball coach in his day to winning as college basketball coach of all time, yeah. man who helped desegregate Chapel Hill. Unbelievable leader, caring champion for the underdog. And this woman looked at me and said, I think Dean Smith is God. I'm like, so do I, you're hired. Yeah. The worst, the yeah. absolute worst hire. Why? So why? <laughs> oh Lord, terrible attitude, no talent. <laughs> yeah. Late, stole, lied, terrible. Oh. And I didn't listen to my team. And so from that moment on, I would interview prospective candidates briefly, turn them over to the team. People would come back a second day for a full day where we would pay them. They wouldn't do anything clinically. They would watch the team, listen to how we talk to patients. Then the team would take my charge card, take them out for a two-hour lunch. And mm-hmm. when they came back at the end of the day, they'd either say thumbs up or down. Right. Because when you get when you do that, they're personally invested in making sure that the person is a success in some respects. Now, one thing I hope you don't mind me sharing this. Tina is amazing, but you mentioned she quit on you because you didn't step up as a leader. I hope you don't mind me sharing that. Like there was a there was a little confrontation, and she walked out on you, and then she came back. Okay, she quit. yeah. So and, uh, that wasn't the only time she quit. She quit about every week for for a couple minutes. <laughs> but, there was a teammate who I still to this day love uh-huh. and appreciate, but who was treating me poorly. Yeah. And Tina was furious at me for not being the leader that I could have been. And after complaining a couple of times, she said, I'm out of here. And she quit for a couple months. It was heartbreaking. Yeah. It was absolutely heartbreaking. And then we put an ad in for another dental assistant. And we got a bunch of ad, a bunch of a bunch of resumes including Tina's, which we took her name off of. 
-hmm. And I had the team looking through them and they picked up this one and went, well, this woman's got 17 years experience and she's Dale Carnegie trained and she's trained in CAD CAM and she can do Invisalign and six month smile and she's implant certified and she's a national speaker. This, and one of our hygienists said, yeah, it's Tina. And I was like, oh man, come on. But, uh, you know, I invested a fortune in my team as we've shared Kirk. Every woman I worked for took a level of Dale Carnegie training. They all trained with Jameson management. They'd all been to national meetings. We went together to the Hinman, to the ADA, to the Woody Oak Spring Break, to the North Carolina meeting at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, the entire team, the, the business team was trained to taking cone beams. The clinical team could go up front, check in a patient, approve, approve them for care credit. So yeah. the team was completely cross-trained and trained inside and outside of dentistry. A thing that we've talked about over the last 16 years we've been doing the COVID seminar mm -hmm. is people say, Dr. Mark, you put all this money right. into these teammates. What if they leave? Mm -hmm. And my answer is, what if you don't put anything into these teammates and they stay? They stay. And so it was the cheapest money I think I ever spent, Kirk, in 32 years of private practice was investing in these magnificent women. Right. Who then, if, if you go through Dale Carnegie training, maybe you're a better daughter, granddaughter, wife, mom, cousin, friend, neighbor. Maybe all of these different, these soft skills that you learn translate to every aspect of your life, not just to your time in the dental practice. Yeah, absolutely. Because dentists always ask us, hey, how do you motivate my team? And my question is, I can inspire them for a little bit. But what do they have to authentically be motivated about? And in an environment like that, you are you're helping them understand this is a great place. They like who they are as a result of working with you. Now, another thing too, I got you and I have shared this story about Dale Carnegie. So when I was 24, um, I had a person make me take the Dale Carnegie course, and I thought I'm not taking a course on how to shake hands and like. I, I know how to do all that. It was a thousand bucks. I'll never forget it. And I think it was 11 or 12 weeks and it was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Things that I wasn't aware of. And I thought to myself, that was some of the best money ever invested. Uh, and to this day, it was the Dale course. So, and then they have the speaking course and they have the other ones, but it's, an, it's a phenomenal investment. But that's really what we're talking about today is the secret to all of this is all of the other stuff that isn't the technical dentistry. Now the technical dentistry is important, but this is the foundation of what really creates a successful practice long-term. And you see it all the time with practices everywhere. It doesn't matter where we go. We see you, I'm sure you see some of the best dentists come out of Chapel Hill. You're like the hands on that kid, unbelievable. And you know, in the side conversation, you're always like, you know, it's, it's about the relationship aspect of dentistry. It's not how beautiful the dentistry is, right? I told my students, I can pretty much tell you right now how successful you're going to be in private practice by shaking your hand and looking you in the eye and saying hello, and you answer me. I pretty much can tell you by one handshake. Yeah. You give the wet fish and you look down and look away versus you look someone in the eye and smile. You know, and I, we role play a ton with the students and we're like, you know, how'd you learn all this? I'm like, well, 10,000 hours of continuing education and the you know, Carnegie training and Panky and Spear and Dawson and and I still didn't always get it right, but I always tried hard. Yeah, and uh, it's just a, dentistry done right. Look, it's such a joy. Right, it can be so fulfilling. Is it hard work? Absolutely. Don't kid yourself. Mm -hmm. It's really tough work, yeah. but when it's done right, what a gift to be able to become part of people's lives. I had a patient write me last night about a family issue. This was my lower school, middle school music teacher who I first met 50 years ago. And she was my patient since 1986 till I left the practice. And I saw her and her husband and her son and daughter, daughter's husband and two kids, plus a couple dozen families she sent to me. And she wrote me about an issue last night. And I'm like, I haven't been her dentist since 2017. And yeah. she's still in my life. And you know, the first paragraph is how much she misses me and the family misses me. And we miss seeing you. And it just is very, it's, um, you think I hear her name and say, yeah, she paid me a thousand dollars for that crown. Or I got to be part of somebody's family. That, that That's the great joy. Yeah. Um, if you, if you trust Kirk Barrett and accidental, you're going to do beautifully in private practice. Yeah. 
But if it's just about the money, you're right. going to have a, it's a hollow victory. Yeah. So that's the thing for the thousands and thousands of crowns that I did. That, hey, I remember pieces of it, but that's not, that's not the most fulfilling part. No. It's when you make an impact and a difference in some people's lives. And that, you, you can't do that when you run from room to room. You can't do that when you tell people that they need something. Yeah, absolutely. There's people out there that fix teeth and there's people that change lives and you obviously changed a lot of lives. It's funny, go back to the handshake thing. I don't know if you've seen the Garth Brooks um, documentary. So my wife was watching it this weekend and it stopped me in my tracks and he talked about the power of a handshake. The most prolific country singer of all time is like, people don't trust a handshake. I can tell in one second from a handshake. Yeah, I can tell by looking the eye, I can tell like, I know in one second, I'm like, that's pretty powerful that you can say that, but it's true in practice. You know, you can tell real quickly um, the authenticity, but you've also got to have the support structure and everything around it um, and the processes. And you guys not only had the soft skills, but you also had the processes down. How much did you work on the process of like how people experienced your practice? Not very often, Kirk, just every hour. <laughs> every Just day every hour. and everything was different and we we huddled in the morning we planned the day and then you're off to the races and yeah. all bets are off and yeah. we, we were pretty brutally efficiently organized and then the day starts and life happens and people get flat tires or the kid gets sick or the babysitter doesn't show up or they just got fired or mm -hmm. who knows what happens the lab has an issue and life happens and so that's where you got to learn to flex, where you have to look at a schedule and engineer it intentionally. And I know you teach that. Right. Instead of filling every line on the schedule, we block scheduled and we booked so that I would achieve my goals per day, usually by the morning. So I was less ungapotched in the afternoon if there was a change in the schedule. Mm -hmm. We got our boulders done in the morning when I was fresh about once a week. I would start at 7 a.m. just with one dental assistant. Often Tina would come in. Now she drove an hour to work and an hour home. If I do a 7 a.m. start, think what time she started her day. That is a long time. That's a long drive. It's a long drive. It's a long day. Just roughly, Kirk, imagine in a typical year for my team, for my dream team, how many days do you think each team member just blew off to go to the beach or go to the mountains or zero? That would be none because how many did the doctor do that for? Yeah. People always, in wait, 30 wait, go, into that. go into that. I want you to explain that because people always say, well, my team members are always sick. And I'm like, mm, I don't, I don't experience when you've got a great team, they, when they're really sick, you just send them home. You know what I mean? But they, they would find a way to get to the office. They would find a way to work. Wouldn't you agree? In 32 years, Kirk, I missed two days of work in the year 2000 when I had kidney stone attack, I was in the hospital. I called the office Monday morning, told them to cancel patients. The team's like, who is this? Yeah. And where's our doctor? I'm like, well, yeah. I'm in the hospital with an IV in my arm. You can bring patients over here. And then I had diverticulitis surgery in 2016 and missed six weeks. But past that for 32 years, I didn't miss a day of work yeah. because I, everybody depended on me, which probably means you can't be out beer bong on Sunday night if you're going to work Monday morning. No, you can try that. That doesn't work. That you live an Uchi life with moderation. Yeah. Moderation in how you eat and consistent exercise and choosing not to smoke. Because it's a battle on your body when you do clinical dentistry. For the team, we profit shared. One thing I promised the team, as Tina shared with you all, I think I had seven of my teammates when I left that had six figure retirements already funded. Wow. And it was important to me. There's some doctors. It used to be that you could fire someone after 14 years and they wouldn't get any of their pension plan back in the 80s. What a nightmare Yeah, that a doctor would be that cruel to a young person to take away their future. So I said to the team, if you stick with me, if you work hard, you love on these patients, you are an extraordinary teammate, I'm going to fully fund your retirement plan. We're going to have an awesome Hanukkah Christmas party. But their birthday, we did a big birthday celebration at the anniversary when they were with me in the practice. We got a rose for each year they were with me. Their families got complimentary dental care. Yeah. You know, we had a hundred dollar rule. I think we've talked about that. The team that spent a hundred bucks on any patient for anything just as a love gift to raise their, the value of the practice. 
So I, I didn't want them to come to me with ankle biter stuff. It's Kirk's birthday tomorrow. Can I have a cake waiting for him? Why are you even asking me? Let's do it. So I tried to build a practice where to the team, the answer was yes, what's the question? Mm-hmm. If you're coming to me, I know you're not going to come to some to me with something destructive. Yeah, I know you're not going to come to me and ask me to do something unfair that favors you other or no, over another teammate. That's not what we tried to build here. Right. So it was a fun place to work. Far from perfect. Yeah. And now, uh, I, yeah. Now I know you well enough, and some of these are loaded questions because, um, but they're super, super important. When it comes to promoting dentistry or selling dentistry, it doesn't happen in the operatory. It doesn't happen in the, you know, in the console room. It isn't how flashy your PowerPoint is. You know, it starts way before that. It starts with every touch point in the office. Can you speak about that just real, real quickly? Sure, Kirk. I, you think about how, to do, how do you grow in practice? How do you get new patients? I think you start being a, a caring citizen in your community. Right. How do people know about you? Oh, I want to go see Kirk Barrett. He's the cheapest. Right. Wow, how cool is that? Not a good reputation. People that told me, Dr. Mark, I heard you're expensive, but you're the best. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. The best costs more. Thank you so much. I don't want to do discount dentistry. Yeah. I don't want to compete in the race to the bottom. So I worked really hard to be a prominent citizen in my hometown and be active. I was on the Eagle Board for the Boy Scouts. I was a team dentist. For the hockey team, I coached my kids in t-ball, soccer, basketball. At the time, we were on their swim team. I was on the board of our synagogue, on the board of our Jewish foundation, our Jewish federation. I was involved in my community. And we tried to spoil our patients, and we would ask for new patients. We tried to set the expectation early. When somebody called, the new patient experience from the first phone call has got to be exquisite. Your website has to be current and cutting edge. Your paperwork, immaculate, no typos. We would send out a welcome brochure. We're going to talk about that this Friday during COVID. Are we still going to send out a lot of paperwork to offices? Uh, The new patient experience, the people walked in our reception room, which was immaculate, with beautiful music playing, plants that had been watered and weren't dead, current magazines. I talked to my students this morning. I had a picture of my reception room. And now we may not have magazines post-COVID, but we had Vanity Fair, Harvard Business Review, L, O, Oprah's Magazine. We tried to have high-end magazines as part of the ambiance. So right. all the message, every message that they got was congruent. Mm-hmm. New patients did not wait. Boom, they were seated in the consult room with the doctor and the treatment coordinator where we would have relationship time. So we had systems. They were practiced. So what if a, if a teammate calls in at the last minute? I, I got a touch of it today. I'm not coming in. Mm-hmm. You're what? Yeah. Every 10 minute book with every teammate. You can't do that to me because that, that ruins the system. Right. So, you know, was there pressure on the team to come in in a good way? I think because we were all in this together, we were all trying to row in the same direction. Right. And it just made it a whole lot more fun. And I love meeting new patients just like you, Kirk. It's a, we were extroverts. We're high eyes on the disc profile. We're expressives. It's a joy to meet somebody new and just talk some junk to them. And mm-hmm. for me, that became, as I shared before, I just got to figure out what's their hot button. Right. I got to figure out why they said no to someone else and how do I turn that into a yes. Right. Right. And the team has to have the same verbal skills. So we did a ton of role playing. We had team meetings every month. We had departmental meetings every week. Like the first Monday of every month, I would take all the assistants out to lunch. Second Monday, the hygiene team. Third Monday, the business team. Fourth Monday, two-hour team meeting. We had six days of in-office coaching during the year. Uh, we went to CE courses. We read books together. It was um, it was like a family, and families yeah. aren't perfect, and families fight, but I was most fortunate. But. Right, and that goes back to what we said at the beginning. I mean, these are all the little things that make up that – they all come together in a beautiful, beautiful story in the end, like how it all works, how it happened on a regular basis. And you made that time commitment. And this Friday, I want you to talk about this Friday because you and I do a lot of education. We've been over-educated the last 15 weeks. Uh, and then we've been putting together the master classes. Most of them have been technical and we've been saving one very, very special 
for this Friday. Uh, and tell us a little bit about what's going to be happening on Friday, what you're going to go through, the details. This is something you cannot miss. So if you're a dentist, you have your own private practice, you want to continue to grow it, you want to deal with some of the bigger challenges that are ahead for you on the road, learn how to be a master communicator. Mark, tell us what, what's going to happen on Friday. Sure, Kirk. I appreciate this privilege with ACT University. Kirk, what you and the ACT family have put together has been unbelievable. It changed the profession. When everybody froze, Kirk Barron acted. And it will be your legacy, young man. And Brother Bill Robbins is the dean of ACT U, the dentist from San Antonio, who is just a star and a giant. And Bill has lined up the finest clinical dentist to show unbelievable clinical successes. But it occurred to me crystal clearly, if the patient doesn't say yes, you don't get to try to mimic the mastery of a Dave Hornbrook. Right. You know, you don't get to work like, a, do a digital workup like Chris Coachman. You don't get to work like Bill Robbins. You don't get to close diastemas like Bob Margie's. So it was always a contention of mine is these courses that teach, you'll do it because I said so. Let's cut right to the crown prep. Well, that's not the real world because that's not the way you get to yes. Right. So what we're going to do Friday, the title is The Ultimate New Patient Experience. Um, interestingly, I changed the entire talk two days ago, Kirk. Did so you really? It's be wait, wait, wait. Cutting Tell edge. Why? Tell me why. Why? Because the world changed. Mm -hmm. And I was looking through my pictures of how we did our new patient experience. And a part of it doesn't apply this month during COVID. It will next year, it will for years to come, but immediately there's been some really major differences. So we're gonna point out eight major game changers in dentistry with your new patient experience that are currently going on. And then we're gonna walk patients, the, the audience through new patient experience from the first phone call to walking in the office, to the new patient discussion, to the photography, to the new patient exam, to the studying and correlating all the information, presenting a treatment plan, com comfortable financial arrangements, and the getting to yes. So we're going to role play a couple, I think four or five really cool cases, including one of my top two all-time favorite cases that I have not shown yet on Act U. So you've been holding and, back. You've been holding some. Goodies. <laughs> that, you're you've been holding back and sharing, holding some goodies. You're you're not you're not yet. Uh, you I haven't. Say I only did twelve or so talks for you. I think you got reasonable amount of my information but right. one of my all-time favorite cases we're going to work it through it together as a group as a family we're going to role play friday we're going to walk through dr mark's 10 questions how to out listen the competition and a paradigm a formula to walk people through this i'll tell you i've trained other young dentists on this i've trained the unc adam school of dentistry students on this two of my students two summers ago called me just jumping up and down, soiling themselves, saying, Dr. Mark, Dr. Mark, I used your 10 questions and I closed a $30,000 case. This is their first month of private practice. Two of them called me and told me they did that. And I'm like, dude, you don't even know what you're doing. They're like, yeah, I know. What should I do? I'm like, okay, let's talk through it. But they were so excited because they didn't sit down and say, Kirk, you need 28 veneers. They worked through the 10 questions and they listened reflectively and with love and support and no guilt. And so that's what we're going to work on really hard Friday. I know it's a holiday weekend. I'm honored that the ACT you would allow me this time because it's a non-traditional for a master class on the soft side, on the soft skills, on out listening to competition. It's almost counterintuitive because most dentists say, hey, I got that part, but what bonding agent should I use? What diamond burr should I use on this veneer? Well, for God's sakes, if the patient doesn't say yes, you don't get to use it. Yeah, And that's the bottom line. And so I want more abundance in dentistry. I want the men and women to be skilled and comfortable with their verbal skills so the patients will say yes. They'll help share their goals for their health and teeth and smile. They'll get your comfortable financials using things like care credit. We'll talk about some technologies, five main technologies you've got to use. And it's going to be amazing if the audience will trust me Friday. I guarantee each of them a million dollar change in the next five years. Yeah, no question, and I can back that up. So let me ask you a question. How many years did you have in private practice? 32 wonderful years. Okay, so if you're watching this, this man has been in practice, had been in practice 32 wonderful years, 32 years of experience. 
and improving his systems over and over again. And how many years were you a speaker, have been a speaker? How many years have you been speaking? Uh, my first talk at the dental school actually was 31 years ago, but my big break in the speaking world, thanks to Dr. Keith Phillips and Dr. Dennis Shimbori, rest in peace, was I spoke at the CDA in Anaheim in April 1999 and my world changed. Wow. Because in 1999, I had five seminars. In 2000, I had 20. 2001, I had 30. It just went boom. Yeah. So 32 years in practice, 31 years as a speaker. There's a lot of experience, incredible tips, great thinking, just a wonderful way to look at how you practice. You can't miss it. So join us this Friday for the AptU Masterclass. That's $49. If you can't spend $49 to improve your life, we have other conversations to have. Uh, you'll join an incredible community. Um, hundreds and hundreds of you have already joined um, at Dental U, so it'll be fun. And uh, buddy, as always, I know you and I, we did this first wave and now we're embracing the second wave of education, not necessarily the coronavirus. That's not what I'm talking about is we've made this commitment from the beginning to just be here for dentistry. I want you to leave us with a couple of good thoughts. Let's say I'm a 32 year old dentist, Mark, and I'm watching, I'm like, hey man, I get it. But like, I got a long career. Give us, give us something to think about for somebody who's got a good two decades in front of them. What would you tell a young dentist looking at a great two decades in front of them? What I hope I can share, Kirk, with the young dentist that's saying, give me an idea to base my career, my future on. There's a bunch of expressions that come to mind. One of them is two things happen when you ask, one when you don't. Right. What is the worst thing that could happen if you are empowered to ask everybody that you work on the rest of your career to accept the very finest dentistry you have to offer? Yeah. They might say no, or they might say yes, and then your world's never the same. Yeah. Bill Carnegie talks about three magic words, success leaves clues. So I didn't make this stuff up. I stole from the brightest minds I could find in dentistry. Right. Again, privilege of me being involved like I have been with so many magnificent men and women. Yeah. Uh, what a gift. And that, it's my calling now for this season of my career to share that at UNC Chapel Hill, to share it with the ACT Dental family, to share it with dentists all over the world as I can. Yeah. And love, love the privilege of doing Zoom calls and webinars. Sure, love to get back into the speaking world where I can be face-to-face -face with people and impact their study club, their dental society, their state, their national organization. We'll be back there, Kirk. It's, it's not going to be this year. I, I, in, by mid-March going forward, I had tw about 20 more gigs scheduled. I'm down to two. Mm -hmm. Buffalo canceled this morning. I've got two left on the schedule. And I'm like, yeah, we'll make a clean wipeout, and it's okay. Yeah. I think I got one. So <laughs> one or two, and I was booked all through the fall. So yeah. We're going to embrace a, a totally new, and different season. It's going to be okay. We're going to get through this, Kirk. We've repeatedly mentioned Yeah. at my vintage. I got good hair, but Eisenhower was president when I was born. And we've been through 9-11 as a profession. We've been through HIV. We've been through the prime interest rate going up to 21%. Two space shuttles blowing up. The dot-com crash of 2000. The real estate crash of 08. This COVID-19, it is atrocious and it's not over and we're not here to make a political statement, but buddy, we're all in this boat together. We sink or swim together. So I want you all to protect yourselves and your families, your patients, your teammates. I want you to work really hard and keep the big picture in mind. A year from now, five years from now, this is going to just be a bad memory. So I, I just want everybody to to be of abundance and not scarcity, to be positive and forward thinking and trust the process, trust experts. When Kirk Barrett tells you something, you can take it to the bank. The men and women Kirk put on the act you, the one men and women he's gonna bring on this best practices that Kevin Groff is gonna have on the Young Dennis Show. There's just so much good going on and we're gonna beat this thing and be better than ever. Yeah, education brought us together It'll keep us together and make us stronger here in the end. And uh, I completely agree. I mean, the important thing is dentistry is going to come back, but it's it's going to rest heavily on how you come back and thinking right, preparing the people around you, talking to patients the right way. I mean, they can sense when you're a little bit 
you know, unsure or uneasy or fearful a little bit. And what you're going to see on Friday is I think the most important thing is young dentists that I speak to often struggle with the word selling and it isn't selling if you believe in what you're doing and you believe it's in the best interest of the patient. And it's really what you do and you do it well. And so you're going to see a lot of the evidence that's created such a great experience for you, your team, your patients uh, in the practice of Dr. Mark Hyman. So don't miss that. Uh, masterclass this Friday, 11 o'clock Eastern time uh, on Act Dental U. Uh, you can register. We'll put a link in the show notes um, and then continue to add questions. If you guys have questions watching, this is our first uh, pivot in taking the conference back out to social media for the first, I don't know, was it 15 or 16 weeks? We kind of kept, kept it I don't know, private um, under, under the wraps of uh, Zoom webinars, but now we're we're going to go a little bit more broad and just try to help dentistry as much as we possibly can. Experts, for the next couple of weeks, you'll see some great ones. And uh, we just encourage you to keep watching. So, Mark, thank you so much for being you. Thanks for showing up. Um, and you've been a marathon man. Nobody has presented more than you. Nobody has given more tips than you. Uh, and you still keep showing up, man. Like a bad check, I'm back. And uh, <laughs> you honor me with your friendship and your support and wow. your trust to get to know the ACT family of AB and LA and the whole crew and uh, reconnecting with old friends, making some new friends online. Uh, it's been a real reinvention for me and a joy. So I hope everybody will join us Friday. I promise them two hours that they'll never forget. And I guarantee everybody will get at least one pearl out of there that would be a million dollar enhancement to their practice and their family and their life. And that's, that's worth doing. Absolutely. Let's stay safe. I'll see you Friday. Okay. You got it. You got it. So you guys, until we see you next time, uh, take good care of yourselves. Take good care of your families. Um, keep investing in your team. And until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Everybody.